call the meeting to order at 7.05. Um, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Okay, so um, what about that thing that needs to be read in, Andrew? Oh, right. Um, I'm not sure if that's the appropriate place, but. Well, I think we can put that in the public comment. Okay. Um, do we have a copy of that report? report or, uh, or we can talk about that later. Um, okay. Uh, we'll move to the consent agenda to approve the minutes of Tuesday, December 19th. And um, to approve the minutes of Tuesday, January 10th, special meeting. Okay. Well, the only um, discussion point that we had was just making sure the owner's name is uh, Audra. So we changed Audra. Audra. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> other than that, it looks good. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. And I second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Rodney? Uh, I, I wasn't at that meeting, so I don't really feel okay. like Vote on it. Okay, well, the minutes are approved. So on the public comment correspondence, um, is there any public that would like to make a comment at this time? Hello, this is Tammy Benoit. I take minutes, and when I identify administration, I try to use the first name and the last initial for conciseness in the minutes. If I'm to take a different approach, please let me know. Thank you. The name's just spelled wrong, Tammy. It's A-N-D-R-A, that's all. It's probably yes. auto corrected, that's all. Yes, um, I understand the spelling, but if there's a different way to present the names, please advise me of such. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. We really appreciate you taking the minutes. <clears throat> Any other uh, public that wants to um, address the board? Okay. Um, there was a letter submitted for um, us to enter into the record. Um, do you have that, Ray, by any chance? I, I don't know. think so. Uh, okay. The roofing one? Yeah. Oh, here it is. Um, so we'll record this letter. It was about the uh, bid for fixing the roofing. And um, yeah, some uh, comments about that, and we'll include it in the notes. Okay, uh, Tammy, I will forward that to you to include into the mats or we'll add it once you send us the links. Okay, thank you. Um, this is a letter from Douglas Tucker. Uh, okay, moving on to board comments. Is there any board comments? Okay, then we'll do the celebration of learning. All right, and so for our celebration tonight, we have Ben Boynton. He's going to talk about our explorations. Hi, Ben. Oh, yeah, I'm here. There we go. Good evening. Um, I think Ray has a slideshow for you. I can't see that. So, oh, now I can. Thanks, Ray. All right, well, hi. Um, thanks for having me here tonight. 
I decided, uh, well, we decided that uh, we would share a little bit about this explorations, which if you follow um, any of our social media feeds, you will have heard a little bit about it through those sources. So just before winter break, we completed our first explorations, which is a new program in the high school for this year. Explorations is, as noted here, uh, a time when students can engage in risk-free, that's ungraded, investigations into topics selected from a menu offered by staff. So the idea is that we want to bring students some topics that they might not otherwise have a chance to explore. These are things that aren't in our um, program of studies. They're not courses. It's just a, a quick shot. I'll spend a little time on some topics um, that are new to these students. So uh, our idea, our hope, is that this leads them to new interests for their lives um, in courses they're taking and hopefully in our Flexible Pathways program. The structure of this um, experience, we used our existing Pathways period, which meets four days a week. So Tuesdays and Wednesdays, we're given over to explorations, these special topics, and Thursdays and Fridays, um, we're given over to our regular Pathways periods. Um, so topics range from wood carving and soap making to historical dives into the history of Palestine and medieval Europe. There were, I think, 16 total um, explorations offered. So when we were done, um, we, after we finished this first version, we asked students and faculty for feedback. So this one's a few comments from students. I'll hold that. You can uh, read that for yourself. I particularly like the last one. I thought that was pretty great. And these two are comments from teachers. Of course, learning should be enjoyable, so if at all possible. So that's pretty exciting. I really like that one about experimenting. So, sorry, yeah, Ray, you're good. Um, so Jeff and I, Mr. Thomas and I, have been using this kind of metaphor all year for how we're approaching explorations and flexible pathways more generally. Um, building the road as we walk it. So I thought I'd throw that one in there. Um, it's a little safer than the whole, you know, fly the plane as we build it thing. So I figure walking's better. So finally, um, for our next iteration of explorations, um, we're going to do three things. Uh, well, for next one, we're gathering student and staff input to inform the design. We're going to build that road together. So we're getting information, gathering that. We're going to start talking about that at our next faculty meeting. Um, second thing, we have solicited topics from students so that this time the offerings are not just what faculty comes up with, but are also what students tell us they want. So hopefully um, at least part of that list will be student driven um, faculty, student driven um, ideas. So the idea is to actually to move. The first one was, hey, teachers, what do you want to offer? And we offered a bunch of stuff. Um, so it was, you know, totally teacher driven <coughs> to kind of turn that a little bit toward the student driven, which uh, which is something we want to do in our school in general. Um, finally, long term or longer term and uh, hoping to get to that this year, we would like to actually sort of turn the reins over to students so that some at least of these explorations experiences are student facilitated with the teachers in um, supportive roles rather than, you know, uh, holding the reins, hand them off and be there ready to help as necessary and support students as they grow into kind of leadership and, um, and uh, you know, engaging roles on their own. So I'm really excited to see what happens next. And I just wanted to sort of hopefully get a little knowledge out there and share this with the folks uh, both here and at home. So thank you. Awesome, thanks, Ben. Um, so, uh, so, pardon me if you mentioned this already, but how long are the expirations? How long does it last for? So we did about four weeks. Um, we did four weeks, actually, over four weeks, but it was only two days a week. So the Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so it was eight class periods. Um, that was a little short for some of the students and also for some of the uh, adults involved. So we're hoping to kind of take a look at, we are going to take a look um, at how much we can expand that time for the next version. And this was something everybody did, all the students? Yes, everyone was involved, all, all students um, there. I mean, there were a couple of other activities. So students who were in driver's ed, 
um, were still in driver's ed and students who were in the dream program, which is a flexible, flexible pathway all on its own, um, stayed in there. So since it was about student choice, we said, well, let's keep them in the things they've already chosen and open the store to students as well. Um, quite likely, uh, well, it will work out this time that different students will be in the driver's ed class. So we'll get students who weren't able to take advantage of it because they were taking driver's ed last time, we'll be able to take advantage of the next one. That sounds like a great program. Forward to seeing where it goes. Does anybody have any other questions for Ben? All right. Thanks very much, Ben. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Um, now on to that principal's report. <coughs> Yeah, so it's two parts, right? We did our normal principles report, and then I think each one of us submitted a social emotional learning report. So it's, it's a lot. So we were able to look at it in advance. Uh, highlighting from the regular principles report, I would just say that I got into a format of just updating on what our PLCs are working on, um, learning that our teachers are signing up for. Uh, what the Wildcat groups are doing on Fridays in the elementary and what they're learning about. Uh, and just, I feel like it's another place to highlight our students in the month, so I've been adding that. Also mentioned about Joelle Van Lent's in-service presentation, which is really for everybody, but um, everyone gets to learn about cognitive restructuring. And uh, some of our elementary was able to participate in the trauma-informed schools, which was quite lovely. Um, and then I would say is we're in testing window. So that's the biggest update for elementary that we're working on that right now. Um, and, and then finally, um, I think the final section about expanding our community outreach. There's a lot there. More grants that um, Francie Slater has secured for us. Lots and lots of money. So we are so thankful to her. Um, so we're up to three grants now, which is amazing. Uh, so we want to thank her for all that. Uh, also, our snowcat program. So we finally got snow, thank God, just in time for snowcats. Um, so last week, we were able to kick it off. We have 50 skiers and 48 skier, skaters, um, and they made it uh, without a hitch last week. We're going to continue it for the next few, you know, seven-ish, eight weeks. Uh, and then we're also working on some other standalone activities, like maybe some outside activities and um, scone making, mindfulness scone making, who knew, uh, through, through King Arthur. So we're looking forward to that. Highlighted our Read a Story Day in December, where we were able to have community come in and read. Also highlighted that we passed out 170 bags for food, of food for families over the break, which was a lot. Uh, and I got a lovely text over a break that Kathy Fector was nominated and awarded Teacher Citizen of the Year by the Montpelier VFW for her community outreach work. And uh, she doesn't, doesn't skip a beat. She's already uh, organizing a sandwich drive. So she's amazing. And then finally, just um, Puppets in Education was also able to offer to both campuses uh, free performance. It sounds like South Burlington won't be able to benefit from that till next go round, but that's what's coming kind of right now. So that's sort of the elementary regular report. I don't know, Pierre. Pierre, you... would you like to? Yeah, <laughs> go second. Or Jeff. Okay, so on the principal's report, so I just, I'm, I'm glad to announce our. Sorry, technical difficulties. Okay, all you. I, thanks, Jeff. I can keep it in order. Good evening, folks. Um, in the middle school, there were several parallel experiences. We too are looking at uh, a lot of assessment data in the next coming weeks um, that we'll use in our data teams, looking at student plans, looking at universal instruction. Um, what I'd like to highlight is really some of the ways we're reaching out to the communities. Uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be visiting uh, the Rochester School meeting with parents, meeting with potential students, reaching out to people that could fall within our middle school umbrella. Um, we're also reaching out to a variety of folks. And I mentioned this now for a reason, as we're moving forward with changing spaces in the middle school, the maker space being one of them, if anyone has pictures of the shop back in its day, I mean, we have decades of experience, but no pictures of when it was a shop. We'd really like to look at ways of um, honoring the past and carrying on a tradition of building and creating. So if anybody has any pictures, we'd love to have some of those.
he's uh, muted. Oh, okay. All right, so for the high school principal's report, I just want to announce our new SAT counselor, uh, Marianne Ralph. So she works Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays, and she jumped right in, and she has uh, already been meeting with about 10 to 12 people already. So that's really a nice thing for us, um, for support for our students. Um, we talked about flexible pathways, and one of the students uh, joined us the other day, coming back from the Army and visited. And, you know, to see that a student that really embraced flexible pathways and is doing a great job right now, I'm just so proud of him. Uh, I remember he came in after he graduated, didn't want to walk, so we had our picture taken in the front office. And a year later, he comes back with his uniform and had that picture taken in the front office, so that was pretty special. Some of the celebration besides Noah coming back was uh, uh, we celebrated our exchange students. We buy flags for them and they sign it and we post that. Um, we had a Coach P night. Um, Coach Perot has coached for over 30 years. Started at Washington, Chelsea, at Whitcomb and ended here at White River Valley. So we celebrated his 30 years of coaching. Uh, we had a recruiting uh, day where the F bud came down and uh, we uh, had a little tour for them of school. Um, we had a science project, and it's just something that we're going to continue to do is that recruiting. So that's our highlights. So we move into social emotional reports. Uh, I, we did more of a narrative this time around, not just the graphs. Uh, so you can hopefully look at it. So um, for elementary, it sort of talks about where we've been and uh, this year what we've implemented, which is a little bit different. So this is a positivity project and some of our planning from the BEST conference. Um, talks about how we're trying to up our universal tools. One example is the peace tables in the elementary. You can see a picture of that. Uh, and then it launches into our data, which I think we have a second to look at. Uh, I thought Quite honestly, that our data looked really great last year, um, and it looks even better this year. So um, you can just take a second to see how it's continuing to drop. That's with an addition of five students are we're doing well, I think. Uh, and that's really because of all of our teachers being on the same page, I think, and working with kids and working to have some universal approaches for our kids. I also think using the Inner Explorer program, which I've mentioned in previous meetings, has been beneficial and helpful to add some mindfulness into our classrooms, sort of slow it down. We had an example of our last this testing around last week, a teacher uh, did a mindfulness just before testing, and um, that was the whole classroom. It's like, calm down, less anxiety, ready to go. So I'm happy to answer any questions as we look through and see our data. That, Really happy with it and just want to continue on this trajectory of learning uh, with our team and uh, trying to make our menus bigger and more explicit to the elementary. So I, did, I have a question, but I didn't want to get too ahead of myself before everybody presented. But so I'm looking through the data and it's kind of interesting because the data throughout the three. Um, age groups is different so in the elementary school you know the, the referrals are down overall this year um wednesdays tend to be one of the lower days of the week where at middle school wednesdays or high school wednesdays seem to be the highest referral yeah. days um so i guess the question i'd have to all three of you is that the data is different in all three right so elementary is down middle school started down but has recently spiked in the November, December, and then high school looks like it kind of just clicked right off yeah. at the gate. So I guess, and that data can be good or bad, right? I mean, you know, maybe we're enforcing things heavier this year than last year, but what do we feel are, are really driving those numbers or why we're seeing the ups or downs of things this year? I can talk specifically to, about elementary. We looked over this as a team and, you know, somebody brought up I remember Thursdays, that class always had eco, and there was some kids that really had a hard time eco, and that was what drove that Thursdays being not really good with the data for elementary. So I do think like one cohort of kids and the schedule kind of can be a thing. At least that was one thing we talked about as far as the season splits days. So I'd have to drill down specifically for elementary about why we did We did yeah, we're going to look more into hump day, right? It's supposed to be hump day where like, and uh, so 
Um, but it, it's so obvious, right? It's just the sore thumb right there. So. Well, I know in the high school, I, I believe, I don't have it in front of me, but I mean, I think last year we almost cut the referrals in half, right? Yeah. Year over year. Yeah. And it seems like the, and then the referrals are up this year, maybe not gotten to last year or two years ago. Right. Was, but I'm just curious what those increases would be. Are, maybe they're just being reported more. Yeah. Or, or no, I can, I can talk about that a little bit. Issue. Yeah. So uh, some of it is the incoming um, class that we have, our, our freshman class. And uh, we're really working with them. And I was thinking about like being a coach. And sometimes, you know, you have that state championship team, and that caliber is pretty impressive. And then some years you have that <coughs> Owen 20 team, but they're still gaining, mm -hmm. and it's growth over time. And I, I can just see that our growth with this group has just been tremendous. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really excited about like working with them. And Joel, then Joel, then yeah. And let come on here. came and she talked about executive functioning and self-regulation and that's something that we're working on now in advisory and so i think before she came we kind of just were like all just didn't have a, like a finger to close that dam you know and now we kind of have an idea of what we want to focus on and it's really just about teaching these students that you know they moved up from the middle school i don't think they had these skills and so they're just skills and now we're starting to teach these skills and i'm really excited to see what this is going to look like because last year it was pretty awesome our, our, everything was down so i was like are we not doing this data the same as and this year it's back to reality with this mostly that one group so we're thinking the freshman group is kind of where the data points have gone oh yeah yeah because if you look at our other three classes they're very similar to last year so it's a growing process but i think it's just to me, it's exciting to have that, right? An opportunity to grow with these kids. And I think now that our teachers are buying in and have you know what we're doing and the plan ahead and advisory, I think it's gonna you're gonna see a big difference by the end of school year. And while I'm at it, so you know, in the report, you know, 43% of the our students are on targeted or specialized plan. And then that's that's a pretty big amount. So you think about some of the students and then I, we didn't have an SAP counselor. And I, I just, I think that is huge. I mean, some of those kids that are going to just go to class or have a problem now have somebody to see. And that's such an important part of it. That's a contract with service. Um, so one thing I would say that would might be useful to go along with this just when i've spoken to some teachers like i i think the elementary data does look great but like anecdotally i've heard them having some challenges and so i'd be curious to kind of have like kind of the school climate like how do the teachers think it's going that comes next yeah we're going to be doing those surveys this climate survey okay. yeah i don't know if they're like just having like a a quick one that's like behavior specific. It's like yeah, it how is, you feel like behavior is going in your classrooms. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, it might not these are kind of hard, like this person got a referral to the thing and I would have time to write it up and whatever it gets into the record things like, you know, how easily is your class able to be managed and stuff like that. Another data point that might show something a little different. Mm -hmm. So like that might be something to look at. And it's not in the report, but it sounds like that behind the scenes, you kind of, you know, by grade level, what those behaviors are. Control down by grade well. level. Control down by kids. <laughs> you can go down by kid at what time of day? Yeah, well, I did like saying the, the pyramid getting lighter at the top, which is a good sign. Because I think the middle school and high school have their own. I just reported out. You did that. So, Pierre, if you're still there, I'd like to report out on the middle school. Yep, I'm here. Thank you. So, I appreciate your question, Chris, and I will get to an answer for you. Um, what we tried to present in the middle school report, uh, in keeping with, again, the protocol of my colleagues, but we wanted to show you a surface level snapshot of how we're using data. Um, what you see here, the typical, again, yes, Wednesdays are. A difficult day hump day you see in times of day where we might have to focus on a transition um, but we also looked at the data in different ways we really trying to build towards a very consistent pattern of writing students up 
and we did a behavioral reset uh, coming back from the November break where we focused on the four behaviors that we were seeing um, most consistently and also most consistently leading to much bigger issues. Example, horseplay leading to a physical altercation fight, um, snapping someone's hat off their head leading to a fight. So we addressed the entire student body. We addressed each grade, um, the we in this case being Kate, myself, um, and Nicole Lamoth, our school counselor, and others. And the four behaviors really focused on um, setting a zero tolerance for hate speech, for um, physicality, horseplay, again, physical aggression, um, things of that nature. And we expected to see a spike in the data. We fully expected to see um, November, December shoot up. If you broke down what was actually being written up more and more consistently, it were those behaviors we were focused primarily on, again, based on the data we were seeing. Um, we expect to see those continue to fall off as we've uh, done our best to apply uh, a consistent response and discipline. And we also, what's not reflected in this report is highlighting the ways our system can continually improve. Areas we still need to improve on our communication all around, um, back with teachers, communicating the issue to staff dealing with it, the processing, relaying that back to families, to the um, staff involved. So we've, we're using it to not only identify the areas to improve and to focus on in terms of response to student behavior, but also how to look at um, where our system could stand some improvement to make a very transparent process. Uh, that's our goal in the end is um, driving towards accountability for all of us and um, a very transparent process in the end. And I welcome any questions. And that's great. And that's why the data is always kind of, it's hard to read into the data because like, for instance, in the middle school, the reasons why some of these numbers shot up is because they, they had saw a need and addressed it um, and put their finger in the pulse and, you know, those naturally came up. So that's, that's, <clears throat> that's why I appreciate these narratives. Yeah, it helps out to explain some of these things. I think having it as part of the packet, not just something they're telling us in the meeting is useful for three years from now. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, superintendent report. Uh, so you have my report. Just an update in regards to legislative session. Um, since we last met, which was last week. Uh, with the budget, the what we the information we've gained out of the ABC event in the tax department is that the yield um, they were projecting a yield drop that is the equivalent of about four cents on the tax rate. It's like the last time, we and so what you've seen here is your tax rate go up by another four cents due to that drop in the yield. Um, I met with. Uh, representative from the joint fiscal office today with a couple other superintendents um, the president of the vermont school business association um, the executive director of the vermont superintendents association um, and what we discussed uh in the sorry the executive director for the Vermont um, school board uh superintendents and like i said the uh, business managers and what we discussed was uh, our concern in regards to the only lever right now being for the legislature due to Act 127, the <coughs> function of school district spending um, being under the 10% ceiling, which is in regards to what your uh, district spending is between FY24 and FY25, long-term weighted pupils. As long as you spend under 10%, um, it equates to uh, the ability to be a 5% tax cap on the equalized tax rate. Why is that a, a problem for us as a district? And why we're a unified district? The problem is, is that the only lever really that the legislature has, unless they were to add a new revenue stream um, to the Ed Fund, is to continue to drop the yield. I'm worried that, that 
this is the number we have right now, right? Like we just got it on Friday. That's what they're projecting. Um, I'm worried it could drop more, frankly. Um, and I worry about that because I believe at this point uh, that that latest yield drop probably put well over 60% of the districts in the state into that 5% cap range. It put all of our districts into it, except for you. Uh, and that's because we gained the most tax capacity within Act 127. So when we get ready to look at your budget, you're going to actually see our equalized tax rate is still actually in the negative. Jamie, why is that a problem? Well, it's a problem that if they were to continue to, to drop the yield, that we could see our tax rate go up significantly and be in the position that the rest of our districts are in the SU. So this latest yield drop put um, three of our districts that had worked really hard to stay under the 5% cap over. Um, and so I don't know where the yield's going to end up. I don't have a magic ball. What we have in front of us is the number we have right now, which is the best number we got. Um, but I'll tell you that I'm concerned that it's going to drop some more. And I'm concerned that, you know, the model shows that it could possibly drop to a point where everyone's in the 5% cap. And, that one, really... and at that point, we wouldn't be able to take advantage of any 10% signal. So I just want to put that out there to say that that's where we are. Um, we'll talk to you tonight when we get to the budget, what you would need to um, either rate the increase in regards to revenue and or decrease to expenditures to get what we were last week. It's essentially a little over 400,000. I put that in my email out to the board yesterday. Um, the At the legislation level, have they, had, have they had identified that this is an issue? Yes. And, and I, I guess what are their proposal fixes? Wait, I have not heard of any that? policy statement uh, from the legislature. You know, what I would say to you is, is that um, I have said this publicly at multiple board meetings, and I've said it today that that I believe that Act 127 is just a flawed piece of legislation, that it was set out to create equity and to give districts like White River Unified District greater tax capacity. What they did, though, is they wrote it in a they focused on the weighting. It didn't actually, I think, take a hard enough look on what these ceiling and caps were going to be. Again. So now it's chasing its tail. I don't foresee them adjusting anything in this session because people have already adopted budgets. Uh, but do I think that they need to take action to remedy it for next year? Yeah. Um, but I don't, I haven't heard any suggestions of what that is yet, other than like people saying it could be you height, you hire the, you, you know, you raise the cap and you lower the ceiling. Seems like if they just cap the ratio of the yield, um, yeah, that would limit the tax impact change, but make it so that your budget still impacted. Right. Yeah. Right. Pretty easy. I think that's the piece they left out of it. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's just tax what's actually yeah, changing. I think the modeling was just not. Anyway. So, you know, my, my take on this, you know, and what I have said to the VSA is I think it really behooves us to continue to share with Montpelier where the shortfalls of the legislation is. I think it, that, you know, they were set out to be a good piece of legislation. What I am concerned about is that, um, that this is going to end up being a, a sentiment. It's going to be that school district spending is out of control and that it's local school districts and superintendents who have not managed their budgets correctly. And that's what's contributing to increase um, taxes. So I hope it's reconciled. I hope the legislature takes a hard look at it. I'll tell you that I am fully um, expecting that, that messaging around what I just said around district spending is going to continue to ramp up um, from all over Montpelier. Because uh, I don't know right yet whether the legislature is ready to look in the mirror and realize that, that there's just some tragic flaws to this piece of legislation. I would imagine at this point, 
it seems like increasing the yield is going to have diminishing returns because you have decreasing you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. 60% of the towns aren't going to be contributing anymore. What they have said is that the modeling shows that the Ed Fund, by just de decreasing the yield, will be able to carry itself. Meaning that I don't know so how many districts volume. that means of pushing over the cap. But it seems like each time they do that, then the districts are going to respond by. I have asked if that modeling was part of it or not, and I didn't get a straight answer. Yeah. Yeah. And around we go, right? Yeah. Well, if you, you know, make it clear that when you push somebody into that 5% cap. I made it abundantly clear, and I even set, shared with them that I had a district do it last night because they have deferred maintenance, and it didn't increase their tax rate. And they worked really hard to keep a, a fiscally responsible budget, and they were under the cap, and they dropped the yield, and they pushed them over. And they could have cut 250000 to try to get out from under the cap. Or they could add 400,000 to do repairs to their buildings that, that need them. And so they added the funds. But I don't know if that modeling's necessarily been represented in their model. Maybe the second. Look at doing it again. Maybe they'll take that into account. So, anyways, that's my biggest piece uh, in regards to the legislative update. Um, the only other thing I would just add, real quickly, I know we've got a lot on the agenda. Is just that PCB uh, testing and um, remediation uh, is continues to be of discussion. But the good news in this district, and that's why I brought it up, I want to remind you, is that both of our buildings have been tested and we were well under the benchmarks. So just to remind the board that that has happened here. Right. Are there any questions for Jamie? Um, all right, so we're on to uh, business manager. I don't know. Did you get a phone with? I don't know. Hi, Sarah. Hi, sorry, just clicked on. Um, you all have my report. It outlines what's happening in the business office during the month of January, in addition to our budget season. And I'm happy to entertain any questions anyone may have. Thanks, Tara. Um, Bodis will be here for open acceptance by the board next month. Gotcha. Uh, policy committee updates. Rodney, was that the last one? Yeah, I, I missed the last meeting, so. Uh, if you want, Rodney, I can go real quick on this. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, in regards to policy committee, you've got three policies here in your packet tonight uh, that have. Um, revisions specifically around some grammar cleanup and introductory sentences. We, this would be the last uh, district to approve those three revisions to these policies. And then the policy committee right now is currently reviewing our uh, drug and alcohol in the workplace policy. Uh, there's going to be some pretty um, substantive changes to that one possibly. The policy committee is meeting with our attorney next Tuesday to review those suggestions. And then also um, our harassment in the workplace policy will be revised. Um, that was adopted in 2018. There's new re requests for revisions that came out of statute in 2022. Uh, and so that one will be uh, done over quite a bit as well. So we'll have a couple of meetings on those two because they're pretty substantive. Okay. All right, um, have people had a chance to review the three policies that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any comments? But it seemed from what I could see, it seemed like it makes the language a little more clear. So I thought the changes were good.
What's your preference? Uh, I've read, if nobody objects, I've read them all and I, I move to approve them all. Uh, the revised policy. The revised policy, yeah. I, I move to approve all the revised policies. Do you want to just read out which ones are there? Sure. Uh, just the names or you want me to read them up? Okay. Uh, revisions to policy B1 substitutes B4, drug and alcohol testing for transportation employees and B7 tobacco prohibition. My motion to pass the revisions to all of those policies. I'll second. Any discussion? <coughs> all right, now we'll do a roll call vote. Um, Ed? Aye. Rodney? Aye. Nancy's not on the meeting yet. <coughs> and I as well, so the revisions pass. Yep. All right, performing art center building projects, safety and security, and HVAC upgrades, <coughs> update from facilities task force. Mm -hmm. Coming in first. Uh, oh, okay. He was going to originally. Okay. So, how do you want? I um, yeah, think he's ready to present. Okay, you're good to go there, Eric. Uh, you're muted, right? Oh, cool. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Um, sorry about that, guys. I didn't make it tonight due to the weather. Uh, my apologies. I was planning on being there in person, but I didn't really want a two-hour ride home. So. And Eric, Josh Pauly's with us tonight, too. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to touch base, I think, just kind of high level on where we're at. Um, and then, Josh, if you want to talk specifically about the Performing Arts Center, um, I'd love to do it. I'm just going to kind of discuss where we're at in the process, um, what measures we're working on developing, what we're looking at roughly for our budget, and then kind of just a pre-development schedule that we're shooting for at this time. Um, so I'm going to, uh, let me jump into this. I don't think you guys really need an actual introduction to us considering that we've been doing some work with you guys now for the last year. <coughs> skip through, if I can skip through these. Introduction to the team. That's our holiday party picture. We do fun stuff. We are an ESCO. All right. Items for review. Um, so we've been working with the task force um, for the last couple months, reviewing um, the building needs and kind of high level building assessments. So we did bring in Banwell Architects. We brought in um, Ener uh, Electrical Systems Group, um, Mechanical Engineer, um, and Civil Engineers and Structural Engineers as well. We did an overall building assessment on your guys' uh, uh, Bethel and Royalton campus. Um, we've been continuing review of capital projects and long-term capital planning as a district. So that's also something that we're working with um, with another SU, um, Keith um, from the SU, which is long-term capital planning. Um, we've also been working with Banwell Architects on project design and space programming. So Matt Giffen from Banwell has met with Josh, has also met um, with the principal um, over there as well. Um, and they've done some initial programming review on the drawings that you guys are going to see here in a few slides. Um, and really what has kind of been settled on after we've gone through, you know, is this scope in, is this scope out? We've really kind of settled on these five major components that we're going to be focusing on. One being the Performing Arts Center, um, which here is showing at 4,600 square feet, which actually includes um, what is kind of this new vestibule that's going to also provide a new entrance to the high school. Um, we've also looked at secured entrances, which you'll see here is for both Royalton and Bethel, um, and specifically at Royalton addressing the need for an actual entrance to the high school that coincides with their parking lot. Um, at Bethel, we're specifically looking at the middle school side of the building. Um, we do believe that there can be security improvements made to the elementary school side that will accomplish a lot of the same goals that we're trying to do at the middle school that I'll talk to you in a few minutes. Um, also looking at upgrading the library ventilation with dehumidification. 
um, addressing the original gymnasium. So the original gymnasium being used as a performing arts center now for their bigger um, performances. And that would still be the case, even with the addition of um, the smaller space that we'd be presenting at the front of the school, um, but really making the original gym um, ready for um, not just music performance, but theater performance. So looking at the, the stage lighting, um, the audio system, um, uh, sound deadening inside the school, um, looking at everything from the bleachers and egresses out of that space as well, and HVAC um, and just general space lighting. Um, also, um, looking at stormwater improvements. So these are um, improvements that are coming through the state with the new three acre rules, essentially saying that, you know, if you have more than three acres of impervious soils, then you guys are required to do something with the stormwater runoff at your guys um, school. And then being that we'd be doing a performing arts center on top of it, um, incorporating that stormwater design with this new addition would be really important because we'd have to also find a place for stormwater um, discharge with the new addition for the added square footage as well. I'm hoping you guys can see my picture here, but this is real um, kind of a real basic um, floor plan of what the performing arts center would be accomplishing. So along this side, on your right hand side of this drawing would be the new entryway to the high school, which actually gets cut off from this drawing a little bit, but I'll show it in the next slide in the elevation. Um, the door, the double set of doors that you see leading out to the drive on this door, this side um, actually is more just for egress. So that isn't really an entryway. Um, other things that were discussed at a meeting at the end of last week with um, Josh and Jeff and Matt, I wasn't, I couldn't make it to that meeting specifically, but really kind of making adjustments to how this floor plan works. So right now, um, this is kind of the main drag that the high school sits on. Um, I know, and they show kind of this more formal entrance um, slash like reception area being off of that main drag. I know based on conversations end of last week, um, they don't feel like that's probably the best location for it. So they're probably looking at relocating that more towards the entrance of uh, where the high school entrance is actually going to be. So, but the L, the general concept providing, you know, some bathrooms, an area for kind of like a breakout space for performances, um, including making sure that we um, still maintain the gym storage. So they have gym storage actually for both the new gym and the original gym. Um, as well as providing some office space um, and kind of a little breakout space for the actual um, music teacher, Josh, and, um, and then obviously storage of all the music equipment as well. So high level performing arts center, and then, you know, really same thing, looking at some elevations. So here's your main entry elevation as if you're gonna drive right by the school. Um, this is the new gymnasium over here on your left um, in this, elevation or rendering that they provided by Banwell, um, which is probably more expensive than what I've budgeted at this point. Um, they show this really nice big glass kind of entryway system. They're showing a you know kind of brick on the bottom with a different type of probably cement board up top. A lot of windows along the front, which you know typically doesn't bode as well for the performing arts, having that amount of natural light coming into the space. So that's probably something that would also get VE'd out of the project. Um, and then the elevation that you would be looking up on the east side is really looking from, you know, the student parking lot or the high school parking lot. And now looking back towards this being more of your secured entrance into the high school. So I know originally kind of what we had talked about is we're not looking at relocating the administration and really kind of changing the whole programming around on the space. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we're curating that catch area. So as students or teachers or other people enter the high school, one, there's actually a formal entrance that, you know, depicts what it is and names the actual school. Um, but two, there's a way that we're going to have cameras there, badge access systems and other ways so that they can enter this front vestibule, get held in kind of what they call a typical catch area that you would have additional cameras in, and then essentially get badged in through the second set of doors that would bring you out into the general classroom space. So ECM, energy cost measure number one, is focusing on the addition at Royalton specific to the Performing Arts Center. ECM number two, secured entrance. So this is the, the entrance leading into Bethel Middle School. Um, same thing, there's no vestibule here. 
Um, we have this kind of awkward ramp that coincides with this um, um, hollow steel tube that uh, holds up essentially um, the, the walkway roof that protects the walkways. So in this situation, we'd be looking at building a new second set of double doors in here. Um, and then trying to utilize the existing window right here for the administration. So same idea that we'd be trying to um, accomplish over at the high school, creating that catch area or that second set of doors in there to provide that second um, security measure um, as people enter the school. So people would come in through the double set of doors. They can check in with Janet or the admin person at, at Bethel, and then they could be essentially um, buzzed in through the second set of doors that would lead you into essentially the vestibule to the gymnasium at the middle school. Um, so trying to keep costs down, working inside of the existing envelope that we have. Um, one of the tricky parts is, you know, we'd have to raise this new slab. So as you can see, we're about six inches below the finished grade of the actual classrooms. Um, ADA requirements only allow for a 1% pitch essentially to get up to a ramp. So in this situation, we'd be raising this concrete slab inside of this entryway, and then we essentially be making a ramp from the new double set of doors out to this existing walkway and trying to feather it to the parking lot as well. Um, same thing, trying to keep costs down while trying to accomplish the same goal and trying to uh, provide a new kind of fresh look to the entryway. Um, thoughts on the elementary school side is that you kind of already have this catch-all vestibule area. Um, really, it's kind of addressing the door hardware, the locking systems, and the cameras. So how does the elementary school access the cafeteria instead of coming back through the main entry of the school? Really looking at, you know, going by the gymnasium um, and by the admin to enter the cafeteria, and then creating that same kind of catch-all area in that front vestibule. So the doors to the elementary school would be normally closed. The doors to the cafeteria would be normally closed. Those would be locked. Obviously, they would still have crash bars from the inside. So in the case of emergency, people trying to leave the building would be able to get out. Um, but then adding cameras as well, and then a second set of buzzer systems so that they can reach the admin that wouldn't be uh, relocating from the middle school to let them into the elementary school side of the wing. ECM number three, library ventilation. Um, there's really no ventilation in the library at this time. Um, it's, it's a stuffy space. It gets hot. It's up on the second floor. It has a lot of windows, um, so it gets a lot of natural light. So part of this process would be adding a new rooftop heat pump ventilation unit um, that would provide both heating and dehumidification to the space, um, as well as ventilating the space with outside air. So we would be tempering the air as it comes into the space. Um, the unit would be bringing, would be re recirculating air from inside the space as well, as well as introducing outside air depending on the occupant load in the inside the library. So that's called demand control ventilation. We'd also be including energy recovery to make sure that anything that we're exhausting is recaptured through the new ventilation system. Um, ECM number four, original gym upgrades. Um, like I had mentioned before, upgrades to meet the music or performing art needs. So um, stage, uh, stage lighting, stage sound system, addressing some of the, the bleacher issues that they have in there, <coughs> addressing the controls, the building control system. So right now they utilize unit ventilators to provide outside air to the space, making sure that those unit ventilators get brought on to the new DDC and off from the pneumatic control system so that we can make sure that we're dialing in the ventilation for um, when they're holding performances in there. Um, and then, um, so that's ECM number four. ECM number five, like I had mentioned before, is the site, is the site drainage. So this is your high school parking lot over here. Essentially, we would be working on regrading and then adding some storm drains as well and creating this drainage swale that would be essentially um, just to the right side of this high school parking lot. So I think it's a lot of trees now, those would get cleared out. This is, you know, your kind of big rocky drainage swale and then we would regrade the grounds and then provide some storm drains and storm leaders that would lean in, lead into this retention pond. And then essentially the same thing would occur with the new addition, um, we'd be redirecting any storm runoff there to this retention. <coughs> So um, project, so like I mentioned, these are the real five project goals that have been identified as from the facilities task force of what they want us to focus on. 
Um, looking at roughly a budget of 3.65 million for the Performing Arts Center, um, secured entrances at Royalton and Bethel of around 600,000, library ventilation upgrades with dehumidification around 325,000, stormwater improvements of 300,000 for a rough project budget cost of 4.8 million. Um, the reason why I, re I left the original gymnasium upgrades, um, they just did their walkthrough last week. I, I haven't had a chance to really get in touch with Matt yet and figure out exactly what those specific needs are gonna be. Um, I know that he did reach out to the fire marshal yesterday in regards to egress because there is some concerns about egress with adding this new performing arts center onto the front of the school. It kind of blocks one of their existing egress doors. So we're looking at seeing what we can do with that to maintain the, the function and programming of the rest of the school um, with this new added performing arts center. So at this point, um, you know, because we're really at this high level kind of design and concept review, um, I think, you know, having some kind of contingency, five, 10% is a good idea. So roughly looking at this kind of total project budget, um, somewhere in that $5 million range, um, plus or minus 5% based, you know, really where we're at on the design process. Um, in discussions with the project development schedule, so the pre-construction design schedule that we're looking at right now, um, you know, this meeting right now, January 16th, we're reviewing, you know, really the overall concept, um, the goals, some high level budgets and some overall project schedules. Um, the plan would be to come back in a couple months in March, present a more detailed outline. So really get into the details of, you know, what's included with that, you know, original gym upgrade, you know, work on the revisions based on the discussions that we've had with the Performing Arts Center. So kind of dialing back some of the design that they've shown so far based off what we'll see from some um, est cost estimate updates based off the latest renderings um, and really just kind of dialing in what these five different um, ECM measures are gonna look like. Um, then we would spend essentially from spring through summer doing drawing development and updated pricing reviews. So it's a, it's a constant, um, situation we'll be working with the architects you know i'll be asking them to remove a lot of that glass spaniel that you that you see at the entryway and try to go with a more economical cost effective way um, and we're just going to be looking at you know kind of every cost measure on the project and making sure that it fits within the overall budgets that i've been presenting to you guys at this time um, ideally we'd be you know that's something that we'd be working directly on with jeff and josh as these drawings develop to try to make sure that whatever we're designing fits within their needs um, we'd be coming back august timeline um, really with a schematic design set so really having drawings at that 70 percent level where we feel that you know a lot of those details have been hatched out uh, we know exactly what the pro programming is going to be we know what every single room is going to be used for We've essentially reviewed that the storage situations are going to meet. A lot of the preliminary permitting review has been complete, and we have a lot more clear detail of what the overall project is going to look like. Um, hopefully at that point, you know, our, our pricing has been updated, and you guys say, great, this project's, you know, right in line with what we're hoping for. Um, and then September, we'd be, you know, issuing a warrant article um, so that it'd be going out for essentially the presidential election in November of this year. Um, if you guys get it passed on the November bond vote, um, then essentially we'd be looking at signing a contract um, beginning of December with the plan of breaking ground on the Performing Arts Center that spring, hopefully. Um, and then summer 2025, addressing the other measures. So doing the secured entrance at Bethel, stormwater upgrades would probably coincide with the, the Performing Arts Center. So I'd probably go past summer 2025 and then addressing the library HVAC that summer as well. So kind of overall wrapping up this whole project spring 2026. Um, so I know this is a lot of information to take in. Um, you guys have a lot of stuff that you guys are working on today, but just kind of high level, this is what we're developing or that we're working on. Um, and these are really kind of the targeted dates that we're trying to meet to make sure that we can, can meet the goals of your facilities task force. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. That was, that was good to look at all the kind of different parts of it. Um, does anybody have any questions? 
but I just want to piggyback onto this. So, so the idea here was for us, well, for Eric to do the presentation tonight. So if there's anything, any large looming questions or concerns that the board may have uh, between now and our next meeting would be to bring that up. And then uh, February, our goal was to have more of the bond information. Um, so financially wise, what that impact would be. And so we didn't really want to bring the bond information tonight because if there's any changes we decide by you know let's take this piece out or we want to add more or whatever it is but um essentially right now it's about you know depending on again you know five five and a half million dollars for everything and you know between what we talked about before uh, a third of the a third of the revenue for the uh, performing arts center would be based on donations and then we have some of our own money that we would use towards that you know at the end of the day the the financial information would probably be in the high two to three million dollars of what we we'd be looking at um on that so um, probably tara or jamie can get us some some information on a 20 year or 30 year note what that would look like and we can make the idea would be at the next meeting, which would be the last meeting for this board, would be to actually get a uh, a vote of path forward if, if the board wants to uh, to move that into the next steps, like Tara was talking about. So. Tara, Tara, I think you did. Tara did get some information from the phone. Do you remember what we? I don't think it was <laughs> for that much, though. I think maybe it was for two. Tara, do you have it handy or no? Yeah, I have two, three, and four million for 20 years. Uh, do, you want me to, do you want me to go over it? Why don't you go over three for now, just so they have a sense. And then we can okay. go set that out, and then the board can digest it more leading up to okay. next month. So at a $3 million bond for 20 years, the current rate, which obviously is subject to change, is at 4.44%. It would give you, when you actually started paying back the bond, it would be a payment of uh, $279,987, which is $150,000 of principal, and then the interest goes down each coinciding year after that. So it's roughly about two and a half cents a, a year. On your current budget, yep. Yeah. And when would the payment start? So this would, when we pulled these, we just had the interest payment would start year one of the bond, and then principal and interest starts year two. Okay. So. On this schedule that I have here. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. And the gym payments, which are roughly that expire around 2028. Two years left for overlap. Yep. I will have Terrace forward that tomorrow to the board, all three, yeah. just so you can look at them. Um, um, so, so Tara, right now, if I'm correct. I mean, can you, the, I think the current total building reserve fund that we have for this year is like 1.38, is that right? Capital improvement. At the close of fiscal year 23, it was $1,441,810. And I just need to back out from there any expenditures we had in the current fiscal year. Okay. So we, yeah. Yeah. Do you have a kind of work? Yeah. No. <laughs> well, we would have had to. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've got $1.4 million currently in the building reserve fund. And what's the current projected surplus from this year? Six. Yeah, somewhere around six hundred thousand. Oh, oh, nine. Is that what it was? That's better. Your unassigned fund balance is nine hundred ninety-seven thousand six hundred and sixty dollars. So, if we're able to get all of that combined into 
a single chunk. That would be, and we want to save some for the reserve purposes. We yeah, definitely. We, we, yeah, we still have roofs to look at, and yeah. boiler here. But that's essentially 2.3. <laughs> Um, Josh, did you want to add anything? And like we currently the... have raised um, half a million through private donations, and that's with me being the band director with a handshake and a smile. I think having a line item budget for the project and the board's support for the project officially will help other potential large donors come around. And I, I, I have two in the wings waiting for those line items so that they can make sure that the, the project aligns with the mission statement and stuff. So um, that's where we're at with the private donations this far. Okay. And we probably, at the next meeting, we probably have a better breakdown of the um, financials of the project, what that would look like. What we anticipate for, you know, we talked about the third third donation, you know, we can figure out what we want to put in there to get to a certain, you know, penny for the next X amount of years. Sure. Um, Eric? I would just I would just say that there is some more grants coming out that I think specifically your library HVAC project, I think could line up nicely for. Um, and then I think there's a lot, usually there's grants out there for the performing arts specifically. So um, I know I have an eye out for it. I certainly plan on applying for that one grant specific to the library ventilation for this school, which is due, I think, in a couple months or a month and a half from now. So um, I, I would say that we have, I don't know of any real specific grants that I would say 100% this would apply to, but we do have essentially the next year to apply for anything that may come across um, that would associate with this. We might be able to pick up another 100 or 200,000. Um, I think there was a couple. Of, I don't know if you want to take them out. A bunch of hands raised. Yeah. Um, well, I guess we can do a little bit of public comment now. Um, we'll yeah do some public comment now. If it lasts too long, well, then we'll save it for that public comment period later. But uh, go ahead, Ian. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah. No, I just was going to chime in. I think there are some grants and definitely some seed the clean water state revolving fund on that three acre site and just being a outsider looking in not fully you know seeing everything it seems like the secured entrances and that stormwater upgrade you know probably need to get made a priority and then just to say quick for the performing arts center uh really appreciate seeing the effort and uh um you know i know there's a lot of folks who are awfully excited about the potential there but again, I do want to hear all the things that, um, you know, and, and hear all the things that, you know, folks have concerns with, with the fire egress, you know, is it the right time, right place to spend this money? Uh, and just making sure that we're not like trying to cram too much into, you know, a small area of real estate, you know, versus, you know, should we have a bigger, you know, picture of where, you know, where could we do, just be wiser with it. That's all. Um, was there anybody else who was looking to comment at this point? Board members have anything they want to contribute? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I think I'm, I would like to, yeah, continue on with the project. But I think it's something that's worth doing. We certainly need to get the ventilation for the library done given you know, what we found out about the importance of fresh air and, and air exchanges and things like that, this needs to happen. And the entrances are also important, and as is having a space for our music program. So, The uh, and task force members, can, other members can speak up. I mean, one of the things that we liked about um, this proposal is that we were really hoping as a task force to be able to speak to the public about 
we are trying to meet several needs. One is continuing to focus on fresh air ventilation, two, school safety, and then three, also um, putting uh, investments into our performing arts uh, to continue to grow that programming. And we felt like by being able to say to voters, like, here's a bond, here's what we've been able to put away to put toward this project as far as capital reserves. Here's what's been fundraised by our new music boosters. And um, here's what the actual bond pairing means to your tax base. And you're able to hit all three of these areas. We felt like it really strengthened the, the proposal. Wow. So that's why we were going at it in those ways. Yeah, I mean, it seems like all those things aren't things that you really want to postpone. And, and we, you know, we, you know, Josh can speak as well. I mean, we, we really believe um, with our committee that, you know, we, we talked about, you know, the, the three A's and how important they are with school and, and arts. Arts is one that we haven't really had a large investment in over the years. And, and we do believe that there is an audience out there that we will be able to attract to our school by putting this investment kind of if you build it, they will come type. so i mean even though we will have a bond payment we do believe that we are going to pick up students that are going to come into our school based on you know these these programs or, or these spaces that we offer so we're you know we were even just kind of throwing it out there what if we got eight to ten new students a year just because of the the arts uh, you know it instantly pays for itself on the bond payment right, right. so and, and we feel that that's achievable um, i definitely think we'll pick up some students <clears throat> because I mean, we have a great program i don't think we've provided them the uh, structures to showcase their talent right like i think that they, we need to provide that support and structure it's it's what I talk to principals a lot about like like master schedule and stuff, right? Like you've got to create structures for people to be able to do their good work. I feel like what we've provided for the infrastructure for our performing arts is not not the work that they're producing. But I'd like to think that's even going to be able to take it up a whole other notch by providing that infrastructure. Yeah, and I think it is a strength of our school. Absolutely, and, you know, being able to build on our strengths and showcase. I think arguably they perhaps might have outgrown what we've given them as it stands right now. I mean, we've got a fast growing program and uh, it's grown exponentially in the last couple of years. So this is the exact time to do it. <clears throat> Oh, I, I was just writing that, you know, also, you know, working with our design team and really kind of trying to pinpoint um, uh, different areas that um, people can donate specifically towards, whether that's a sound system or a lighting system. And then, you know, really having some of the architecture renderings um, and then kind of some of those added bonuses of, you know, here's your base that we can provide under the bond. But, you know, if you guys want to have that next level sound system towards, you know, at the existing gym, like here's an option where somebody could specifically donate towards. And I think um, so having our kind of design process assist you guys in your fundraising efforts, I think um, will be a, a big benefit to hopefully coming up with more than that half million dollars over the next six months as you guys lead towards this bond vote. And for anybody that hasn't been up to speed, so so initially what we had talked about with the Performing Arts Center to get it off the ground and, and be attractable at a bond vote was, was to um, have a third of the revenue be, be fundraised. So, it, you know, if it's 3.6, then we were looking at, you know, three, $3.2 million to be fundraised. And, and then, I'm sorry, 1.2. And then once we got to that minimum threshold, then then any other money that was raised could go directly into that space for upgrades. So like like Eric was talking about because um, we do know that there's potentially some donors that would rather see a, a certain item or a certain upgrade in that space rather than just donate to the building <coughs> we feel that's an option to be able to improve it um okay uh is there 
Any other comments people want to make, or should we move on to? Uh, it seems like everybody's supportive of the project still and wants to <coughs> continue on to the next steps. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. Have a good night. Sure. All right, um, audit update. I received the first draft of your financials this afternoon, and the plan is that it will be ready for your adoption at the next board meeting. Thanks, Tara. Um, FY24 or 25 budget. So you have budget. So, okay. look, I'll go first here and then you can go. Yep. You have your budget in hand. The the biggest change, the, the only change, is what I just talked about, which was the drop in the yield. Um, and Tara, their pupil changed just slightly. Yes. It went from um, 1,096.45 to 1,095.42. So as you know, Terry can walk you through the tax sheet and show you what that yield did. And essentially, like I said, added about four cents on the tax rate. So Terry, you just want to walk them through that again. And as Terry gets ready to do that, I would just say to the board, you know, we're at a place around the board giving direction around, they have two options. One, you could decrease the budget if you chose. You need to cut it by a hundred, just you know, just over a hundred thousand um, to get a penny, or you could choose to use some of that um, surplus funds that Tara just talked about and use it as offsetting revenue. And same thing for every just over a hundred thousand, use as offsetting revenue and decrease the tax rate by a penny. The only thing I get a little, bit, a little nervous about too is just know that. This, we're using the yield we just got Friday, and I don't know if that's the final. Yield. <clears throat> How are you, Tara? Okay, so we'll start right up at the top of the tax sheet. Your expenditure budget, um, as it sits, is fourteen million three hundred eighty-two thousand ninety-three dollars. Offsetting revenue is $1,291,365. That results in an Act 68 education spending of 13 million 90, 90, I can't even talk now. $13,090,728. We divide that by your long-term weighted average in version five, which is 1,095.42. And that results in the education spending per pupil cost of $11,950.42. Divide that by the new yield of 9,171. That gives us an equalized residential tax rate of 1.3031, which keeps us under the threshold and also is a reduction of 2.96 cents over your fiscal year 24 equalized tax rate. <coughs> so the next box down is the Bethel specific. The We start again at the equalized tax rate of 1.3031. We divide that by the CLA, which is 79.77. That gives us an estimated homestead tax rate of 1.6335 after the CLA which is an increase of 12.46 cents over the current. On the other side, we have the Royalton. Start with the equalized tax rate of 1.3031. We divide that by the CLA, 79.44. That gives us an estimated homestead tax rate of 1.6403, which is 7.91 cents higher than the current. And then down at the bottom, I gave you what that cost would be for 100,000, 250,000, and 500,000 dollar homes. All right, so that's unfortunate about the yield. I, mean, I felt like we were in a really good place last week. Um, so it does make it a little more difficult. You know, it's 
the fact that we're still seeing a decrease in the equalized tax rate, which essentially means that if everybody had the same value house that they did last year, we would have a tax decrease. Um, you know, that's still positive. Um, but then now we're looking at an 8, 7, 12 and a half cent increase in the nominal tax rate. So where do people, what do people think at this point? I mean, you know, the, the physically conservative portion of me says, you know, we can do better. Uh, but like we talked about the last meeting, you know, we did propose a very responsible budget. A majority of the factors are out of our control. Um, it would have, well, actually, the budget we would have proposed would have put another six hundred and something thousand dollars away. And we would have shown a savings of a couple of pennies in the town, right? Uh, and then the second revision of that is when when the um, CLA went down to 9%. 9%. So then we had to take our savings, our future savings out. Um, and then, you know, we went up to what, seven cents, something like that. Um, I guess the argument at this point is there's about $200,000 worth of growing that we have put into this budget for, you know, continuing to attract um, our base going forwards and providing uh, better services um, that we've talked about. And then there's the carryover uh, money from one budget to the other, you know, that we could put towards it. But at the same time, you know, designating that money for future projects like we're talking about to grow, continue to grow the school, um, I feel is probably the better way to go. Um, I, I know, you know, I live in Bethel, so 12 cents, going up 12 cents is a, is a drastic increase. Um, but at the same time, a majority of our neighboring towns are probably going to see 20 cents. Um, not to say that, you know, you know we should toot in a horn, but, you know, we're still pretty far ahead of the average town. Now, a lot of voters, again, I think we're going to have to do a really good job of educating, I mean, really educating voters on what is going on, what are our neighbors looking at, why did things change so much, um, you know, really get them to understand how CLA impacts it and how the yield impacts it and, you know, and those types of things. And really, you know, hate to say it, but the majority of this are things that they should be talking to the legislators about. You know, what are you guys doing in Montpelier? <laughs> what, you know, you're balancing our budget, you know, and you're changing your yields. And, and uh, you know, this is the risk of funding education through property taxes, right? And um, funding through property taxes on the state's end is the safest way to go because you're guaranteed you're getting money, right? But on the taxpayer's end of things, means that you are more apt to get an adjustable rate every year, which we're seeing, you know, surprise. The government's getting their money, but we're getting an adjustable rate this year. So uh, I, I think maybe with some guidance, if we can, we talked about a bunch of things that we could do to educate last time. I think we need to add to the list of what information our surrounding towns might be looking at, because if they start looking at 20 cents a year and 22 cents a year and 18 and we're at 12 or seven, I think you know that'll help digest it a little bit, uh, but it, it's really going to be a tough year for people. Um, not to mention whatever the towns go up and things like that on the other end. So, uh, but I, I I would vote to you know continue to build the school. We have a lot of traction currently at the school that we haven't had for years, um, and, and you know putting aside uh, the money into the capital fund that we can use for potentially some of that for this bond vote and for the other projects we have going forward. So. Yeah, and then I guess with uh, putting aside the money to make it so that the bond vote eventually is less versus making people happier now so that they might be more, like if their taxes aren't going up quite as much, maybe they'll be more apt to vote for a, a bond. But. I, I would lean more towards the lower bond vote. So that, and, and we had talked about this at this board a couple of years ago that 
you know, that stormy days were coming, right? And we were moving this money into capital funds so that we could continue to build our school even when the budgets go up, right? And I think here is a testament to that. Peggy, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking a lot of people are gonna be hurting. <clears throat> I don't know if we need to go ahead with this budget, but also have a clear picture of what we could do to reduce it if we had to. Not just go in and say, this is the budget, this is what we want, but we need to really be honest and say, yeah, we could reduce it, we could eliminate this or do Go, go in with a clear picture of what it means if we don't get this budget. Yeah, I mean, I think like there were a couple of things that were added to the budget. So if we say why they were added and give a justification, then, right? Yeah. You know, if the voters decide no, we don't want to do that, I mean, add a couple yeah. of pennies. But I mean, you very well could have someone come in and make a motion that this is how much money we're going to. We're going to reduce this budget by X amount, and this is the money we're going to vote on. And they're in charge. We're not. So we need to be able to defend it and say, this is what we want. This is what we put in. And if they start saying, well, we've got to reduce it, we've got to have a plan. I liked what we had. And like Chris said, I feel like we were already being responsible and if we hadn't been thrown a curveball we'd be looking great right now i really don't think that there's much that we can cut without doing a disservice to things that we've already discussed quite extensively and things that i wholeheartedly support uh, but what peggy just said is is true in that there's gonna there's a line that can be drawn so we need to explain we do we need to explain to our con constituents why uh, some of these things are still going to happen, but I think each and every one of them should still happen without question. We're just going to have to make everybody understand why they're as important as they are, but I don't see any reason to take any of them off the table. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we have the $900,000 surplus is definitely a benefit in that if people want to lower the tax rate, we can. It just the bond a little harder, but you know we have some room to play with there. Um, you know, it seems like some of the things that we were added to the budget, like if we take them out, it's only you know, a couple hundred thousand. So it's not I mean, the majority of the stuff that adds to the budget is health insurance upgrades and increases and things that you know, we don't really, you know, we have to cut existing services to mm -hmm. match. But like the fact that we have that. Surplus that we get to play with, but it does make if we did you wind up having to use it next future years harder. Anyway, um, Rodney, you have any uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, the the I mean, I guess I pretty much agree with what everybody else is saying. Yeah, it, it's quite an increase, and it's it might not set well, and uh, yeah, we we might have to come back and you know refigure it but i guess we'll worry about that when time comes um that is one of the benefits of the floor vote is that we can adjust it mm -hmm. and if we need to yeah. and, uh, no there's gonna be a lot of people that aren't happy about it and i don't know there's not really a lot we can do though all right um Go ahead, well, I was just going to say, sometimes having a large surplus isn't necessarily a good thing because that gives the impression that we're we're just asking for money that we're not using wisely and we're just saving it up. That maybe we shouldn't have asked for all that to begin with. Sometimes that can work against you. Right. I mean, in this instance, it's because of the federal grants and stuff. Right. You'd have to explain that. But you look at, all oh, they've got $900,000 over. So why are they asking for more money? That's what you're going to get. 
So I think one way that, you, that the board would do that will have to be ready to proactively discuss, I think, is how we've leveraged extra funds. Right. And that, you know, we've done it in a way to offset local district costs without all of a sudden being like, what I would say is some neighboring districts, not an RSU, actually, we've done this not that way. But part of what's driving the Ed Fund right now is that people added a bunch of positions using ESSER funding, and now they're budgeting for those, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And what we've done, if we've added any positions via ESSER funding, we've budgeted for those over time. Or what we've done is use ESSER funding to contract services and also to offset local district costs in regards to interventionists and things. So that we could then build up reserves to continue to improve our, our buildings over time. Well, it seems like we have a consensus to move forward. Um, so, unless people have anything else they want to discuss, I would um, entertain a motion on the budget where we need to have the exact amount that we're spending listed. Um, when, when do we have to do that? Because how long before will they'll actually settle on a number or will they? I really need it next week to get it to the printer to get the book in people's okay. hands. Yeah. yeah. Just um, the printers are so busy right now with town reports yeah. and stuff. Like last year, we were tight. I'm supposed to have it in people's hands within 10 days okay. if we were tight. And we need, to, okay. we need to get the warning out. Yeah, so yeah. No, I, yeah. So. Really, it'd be next week. And I don't see the they're not gonna, I don't see it now that they've changed it again since December one. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're gonna get fresh reports on the yield until they actually start to see what budgets are settling at. So my sense is we won't even get a, another adjustment now, probably until after we vote, like in March. And that might be when they adjust it. Mm -hmm. Before the vote. Yeah. My sense is because they just came out again, they don't usually give us like lots of them. They'll usually like give us one in the middle. And then as budgets like get approved and come in, mm -hmm. they'll adjust again. All right, well, um, Tara, would you wanna give us language for, all right. I've entertained a motion to approve the 2024 budget in the amount of uh, $14,382,093. 24-25. A motion to approve the 2024-25 budget in the amount of $14,382,093. Do Second. Second. Uh, any discussion? We will call vote. Um, Ed? Aye. 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 Rodney? Aye. All right, so the budget has passed. Um, okay, so the annual warning is <laughs> at the end of the um, mm -hmm. end of the packet. Last page is the annual warning. Um, so. I think with Article 9, we would just need to fill in a number that we want to set that for, Tara? Yep, that's all I need there. And okay. I would just remind you, I wouldn't do the full balance just because if when we cross fiscal years, we have prior year expenses and leaving some money in that fund helps cover that. So I would leave a little bit in there. Like 900000 Yeah, that would work. Does that seem reasonable to everybody? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So we change that to 900,000. And looks like everything else is already mm -hmm. in place as it should be. Um, so we need to approve this. Yep, you would approve the warning as written and presented, and then I can email it to 
Ray, and I think Ray can put there, and then who's there tonight can sign it. Great. And then Rodney, you and I can connect to sign it. Nancy won't be here till next Tuesday, Tara, but I had told her I thought we were fine timeline wise. Yeah, that'll be fine. Okay, um, I'd entertain a motion to approve the annual meeting warning as presented. So moved. Seconded. Okay, any discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Ed? Aye. 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 So, annual meeting warning is passed. On to the annual meeting prep, including mailer. Um, so, I'll get started with writing um, a first draft of the um, letter to include. Um, I, can I, I probably can have, are there other people who are willing to help with drafting that? I don't think we want to do a quorum of the board, but mm -hmm. I don't think we do a quorum. Maybe if you send it, maybe happy to read new suggestions and all that. I don't want to okay. co opt anything, but I'd be happy to help. Okay. All right. Um, and I'll try and get that done within the next week. Please. Um, yeah, so in our timeline, it's really to have it all together off to the printer. <coughs> uh, and principals are working on their report. Tara will do her figures. I'm going to really emphasize my report this year, trying to, and the best way I can to simplify 127. And I may even do a QR code that people could take a picture of and it links into a video. But I'm going to try to explain it a little more with like a screenshot. Um, you might have to explain the QR. Code. Like the, I just, I, I'm just, I continue to be just, you know, worried. There's just a lot of changes in all this. I think the more people can hear it and access it. Um, I did talk to Principal Thomas and Principal Bowen today about, uh, we do have a little radio podcast that we do weekly. from the school, the local radio station. And they try to join that school podcast. To just talk it through a little bit and then we'll send that out too so if people have questions because we can take the podcast and send it out just to give people multiple mediums um i've told my office in general that, that i am i have other people that are very focused on student instruction and learning right now but i'm really focused on budget for the next until tell me like we, we've got to get out there and educate folks about this so budget informational meeting, what are we looking at for that? Well, we usually wind up trying to do two. Um, one, you know, a couple weeks in advance, and the other uh, closer. Um, our regular board meeting is on the 20th. Uh, February break is the uh, 20th. Yes, yeah, so the 17th. Um, so we could do maybe one, uh, um, the week before February break and one the week before after, which would make it, you know, the week before the annual meeting. The so one would be the week of the 12th? Yeah. Does that seem reasonable to people? It's kind of what we've done in the past. We don't frequently get a lot of um, people coming out to them, but you know, it's good to get the information mm -hmm. out. And, um, so we do what? One on one campus, one on the other? Is that what you're thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what were the dates? Well, we haven't set dates. No. Um, we, we could move the 20th meeting if you wanted to piggyback on those. I think that would be good. Yeah. If either, either the 13th or the 27th. I'm going to be out of town, so I appreciate it. That if we, um, 
the raise my hair. Tara, we have a meeting already on the twelfth. Is that a Tuesday? Well, well it's Monday. 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 Mondays are good. We don't have anything. Uh, but I, I won't be able to make any second or fourth Mondays. That's that good. Wednesdays work fine too. Just Tuesdays have standing board meetings. The twelfth is currently open, Jamie. On my calendar, I don't see any board. This for Chris. Do the Wednesdays work for people? We didn't do Mondays. Yeah. All right. No, I think that works for me. Um, yeah. There's Wednesday for me. Okay. Right. Rodney, does that work for you? Wednesday the 14th from Wednesday the 28th. Okay. Do we get Valentine's? Day? Oh, it's Valentine's Day. Yeah. Oh, no. Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably not. Okay, maybe not the 14th. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can do the 15th, that would be. That's a Thursday. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that work? Yeah. 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 You watch there be a playoff game or something. I don't know if that's that's good. Um, do we want to just stick with the seven o'clock time? Or mm -hmm. it's fine. We yeah. Like the seven o'clock time. And what's your second date going to be? Uh, let's do the twenty eighth. I don't think that one. Does anyone know in the pre town meeting? They usually do that the week before. Right. The Thursday or Tuesday or we do the Tuesday. This would be the day after. Can, <laughs> can I just request that the fifteenth meeting be on the Bethel campus? Yeah. Yeah. I have, it would be so I can just go from right. there to yeah. this meeting. Yeah. I think that's what we'd want to do is because the mm -hmm. annual meetings on the Bethel campus. So if we did the early meeting at Bethel okay. the week before or after. Okay. And where do you want to piggyback the non well, February meeting on the 15th or the 28th? I mean, it's the normal one's supposed to be a job. So I guess we do. Yeah. Raise it. Uh, sorry. Um, the regular meeting is during the school break. Right. We say so we're going to move it. I'm, I'm sorry. To either one of these two informational meetings. Um, so the idea is we do the informational meeting for an hour or whatever. Maybe start and we can keep it tight. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start at 6 30? 6 30. Yep. Does that work with your fast logging? Yeah, I'm usually done at 6. So it's on that one. Yeah. So on the 15th, 6 30, budget information. Right. We usually do that first. Mm -hmm. Give a half hour. That one's going to be the combined meeting. Yeah. And then we'll start at 7. Mm -hmm. I'll be late. 7 30. 15, or whatever. Got a lot of lot of numbers there. And then Brighton will be seven. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then what was the other date? The twenty eighth. Twenty eighth. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um and when we get closer to the fifteenth door, I'm not sure. Um someone go right here. Get them up? Hundreds of them. Um, okay, Minuski Valley School Choice Alignment. We need to take some action on this. Yeah, so in the last two years uh, with Minuski Valley School Choice, we've uh, done 10 in, 10 out. That's essentially the minimums on each. Just an explanation this is uh, high school choice between public high schools in Vermont. Um, we don't get any money against exchange when people go from place to place, but you can set how many you're willing to allow leave the district and how many you're willing to allow coming to the district and 10 has been the um minimum for allowing both in and out mm -hmm. um we've had a we actually um we had a district who we didn't hit the threshold in either way we were close on entries in um and there was a district that actually got capped that had more students that they wanted to have come in. 
um, it was in rent to the north of us. Um, so their their ten had been like how many hours kept. That's why they weren't able to access us. It wasn't that we had met ours, but if they had all chosen to come, um, I do believe one of theirs would have been waitlisted for the year one uh, at the ten if they had all come. So you know, again, there's not no funds change hands. Um, you know, do I think it's it's great for us to be able to start to speak to that we have more, you know, more students choosing to come here than have a desire to leave? Yes, I do think it's something we should start to publicize as that number has really started to change over the last couple of years. Um, because at one point we had more out than in, um, and now we're much more in than out, um, which is good. So I don't see the 10 and 10 being an issue. Um, but if you want, if you were gonna think about doing anything, allowing a couple more in would be my recommendation, just based on the desire of other folks. What's the cons to letting more people in? I mean, we want we we're not one of our driving goals. <laughs> I just think sometimes it's just you know some district boards. It's a great question. I'm glad mm. you asked it. Struggle with like, well, wait a minute. Like, what's the gain? There's not money following. Right, like we don't get to count them. Right. Uh, they don't count toward our equalized pupils. Or sorry, our weighted pupils. Um, it's not like we get tuition. But you know, and I do. Uh, I was actually talking this a little bit about the facilities committee. I do think there's a gain in word of mouth, meaning I'm a student that chooses to come here from Winooski Valley. I have a positive experience. I'm at friend's house. who are in a choice school choice town. And I say, yeah, no, I'm coming to, to White River Valley High School because I want to for Winooski Valley. And that family says, well, I hadn't really considered uh, White River Valley. I might want to look into it. Or in fact, you're going to play with the team. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm, 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 I, I don't, I, I, it's not going to affect, change our staffing levels. Right? Mm -hmm. like I always say at high schools, you can add 18 to 20 kids and you're not even going to really see it, right? Like our class size is not such, but we're, in some ways, a healthy dynamic. I also think it creates you know, other friendships, as Andrew said. Um, so, well, I was thinking that the level you just talked about. Obviously, if we got 50 kids that want to come That's here, we're going to get nothing for them. Yeah. But the difference between 10 and 12, those two kids, it's almost like bragging rights. We, we've got the prestige that people want. We have the place that people want to be. So if it was to question, like, I wouldn't want to wait list one kid or no, two kids. Like, I'd want them to come here and, and for us to be the place to be, because that's, I don't want to say it's advertising, but it's, it's great word of mouth. So. so that the recommendation is maybe go to 12, is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah, I, I would say that we should definitely increase the number. So I don't think there's any problem with going to 15 even. Yeah. 15 in, uh, 15 in 10 out. What is our current? I think it's three or four. And um, I should have brought that number as I normally do. But it normally, it in general, it's been a couple students who chose early on, and they're, I don't even know what yeah. grades they are. They may be they might graduate. Yeah, we've never approached either no, in no. my time on the board. So, mm -hmm. but I don't see any reason not to do 15 and 10. Yeah. Interesting motion. The levels at 15 no, motion in to increase the level to 15 for uh, the Winooski Valley School Choice allotment. In and 10 out. Yeah. In, in so, so 15, 15 and, and 10 out. Yeah. And a motion. Second. I'll second. second. Yeah, there you go. Peggy's got second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in, uh, I guess we'll do it. Uh, Eddie. Hi. Resignations. We don't have any resignations. We do have um, 
a new hire, Michael Epchuk, who is a graduate from um, South Royalton High School, had joined us as a long-term sub in Spanish. Um, and uh, our, our Spanish teacher, Senora Teller, did you go better? Caroline, yeah. Caroline, okay. <laughs> I was trying to show my aspect. Yeah, like it. Okay. Um, uh, is has been on maternity leave and is going to be on maternity leave for the end of the year. So Michael's coming on to finish out the year. So we're welcoming Michael for the rest of this year um, as our Spanish teacher. Uh, we don't have any other at the moment. Future agenda items, we'll have the uh, Red Community Engagement Task Force. I haven't lost track of that. It's just we had a full agenda tonight. I definitely think we should revisit that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, maybe what we need to do is have that mentioned in the uh, meetings and at town meetings, see if we can get anybody interested when we have a good audience. Um, and we can all include something about it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I figured it's a good placeholder. I don't want to lose it. Yeah, no, good. good. Um, so, but why don't we plan on, we'll leave it in the future again on items, but maybe we can plan on it out of March. Yeah. Okay, we'll actually people. It's a good call. Interested. All right, the next meeting is not Tuesday, February 20th, it is Thursday, February 15th. At, well, I guess our regular meeting is going to be at 7 15 p.m. at the Bethel campus. With the 6.30 informational meeting before that. I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All right, thanks everybody.